the moment. All right, we are beginning. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen, your excellencies, friends and colleagues. Welcome to this Resiliart debate organized by the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign toward a culture goal in the Sustainable Development Agenda. My name is Dr. Ege Yildirim. I'm a heritage planner and member of the International Council on Monuments and Sites, or ECOMOS. Um, and on behalf of my fellow organizers, I have the great pleasure and honor of welcoming you, our speakers and attendees, where we explore the crucial role of culture for the well being of people and planet, and in particular, what a culture goal could look like in a post 2030 development framework. On these particular days, when we are all concerned with the latest conflict that has erupted in yet another region of our world, we find it timely to remind the founding principle of UNESCO, the Global Agency for Education, Science and Culture. Since wars begin in the minds of men and women, it is in the minds of men and women that peace must be built. We hope today's session offers a meaningful occasion to reflect on how and why we must harness culture in building a more peaceful world for everyone. Before we begin our discussions, let me remind us all of some housekeeping matters. The session is recorded and live streamed on the YouTube channel of IFLA to be available afterwards as well. Questions you would like to pose to the speakers should be written using the Q&A button at the menu bar below on your screen and other comments should be written in the chat box. There is interpretation available for French and Spanish thanks to the kind support of UCLG, our campaign member. Now I have the pleasure to pass the floor to my fellow moderator, Mr. Jordi Pasquale, who will provide the conceptual framework of today's Resiliart debate. Thank you, Jordi. You are muted. Indeed. Thank you very much, Ege, Tishé Courler. A pleasure to have you all. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. To all, indeed, uh, a pleasure for the campaign this campaign unites several global cultural networks since 2013. We have produced four policy documents on culture and the SDGs. In 2013, a proposal for a standalone goal, a manifesto in May 2014, a document on indicators in February 2015, and a summary document on the 25th of September 2015, the same day the United Nations General Assembly approved the SDGs with the name progress made, but substantial efforts remain ahead. We also produced a statement on COVID-19 in April 2020. And our vision document for the decade of action 2021-2030 was released in May last year, 2021. And then last but not least, we have written two reports on the place that culture has or has not in national reviews the VNRs, and in local reviews, the VLRs, September 2019 and December 2021. We, as you see, we are fully committed, committed to the achievement of the, of the SDGs. We have also been active in the high-level political forum, the body of the United Nations that monitors the progress towards the achievement of the, of the, of the SDGs. All these documents, all this activity is in our dedicated website, uh, culture2030goal.net. The campaign has championed the role of culture as a driver of sustainable development. This fact is now widely recognized, not least in the mandate of the Mondia Cult Plus 40 conference, which UNESCO has convened as World Conference on Cultural Policies. It will take place in September this year from the 28th to the 30th of September. The conference will take place in Mexico City, 40 years after the first global conference on cultural policies held in that city in 1982, a key landmark in the history of cultural policies. Considering the significance of the networks of this campaign and also considering the documents and the processes we have launched, we expect to play a role during Mondiacul 2022. Of course, this role will have to be discussed with the host country Mexico and with UNESCO. We believe that in the preparation of Mondia Cool 2022, the best the campaign can do is to follow our vision document, 
which looks at the future with bold proposals. And this Resiliart event is, in fact, a bold attempt to begin exploring a culture goal. Why, how, with whom? So this is the purpose of today's, today's event. Ege, the floor is back to you. Okay, thank you so much, dear Jordi. Uh, we will now um, ask our distinguished panelists um, to help us um, address the four questions that we have put forth regarding today's topic. Uh, we have uh, envisioned this in two rounds um, with two questions each, where um, Jordi and I will ask our panelists two questions um, and, and ask them to make a four minute intervention in response. Uh, apologies in advance if I cut you off at any point. Um, I hate to do that, so I trust you will keep time well <laughs> with us. <laughs> we have many um, many pieces to go through, and it, they'll all be very interesting, I know. Um, afterwards, we will also ask our panelists for a further reaction um, to what has been shared. Um, then we will take questions and comments from the audience, uh, followed by a response from members of the Culture 2030 Goal Campaign, and end with a set of final words from our speakers. Uh, so today we are delighted to have with us, um, in order of intervention, I will just say the names first, uh, Dr. Toki Lauten brown uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Dana Firas, Mr. John Crowley, Mr. Carlos Villa Senor, and Dr. Alexandra Zantaki whom we will introduce in more detail shortly. Uh, so now on to the first round of our questions. Um, here are our first uh, two uh, questions. Uh, firstly, what for you should characterize the post-2030 development framework? And secondly, where do you see culture fitting into this? So these are the first questions in this round. Um, now I would like to introduce to you um, Dr. Toki Brown um, quickly. Um, Toki, our good friend and colleague, is a heritage architect and a cultural economist at Merging Ecologies, member of ECOMOS Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes and also member of ECOMOS Nigeria. Um, she has 13 years professional experience in conservation area character appraisals and management strategies, conservation management plans, cultural landscape characterization assessments, and site restorations, mostly in Africa. Ex she's an expert member on the International Scientific Committee on Cultural Landscapes, as I um, also said just now, ICOMOS IFLA. She has published articles on cultural heritage and marginalized heritage. She's a doctor of science in economics and techniques for the conservation of the architectural and environmental heritage from the University of Nova Gorica and Università Y di Venezia in Venice, Italy. Uh, so, uh, dear Toki, um, here you go with the questions. The floor is yours. <laughs> Okay, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever, where everyone is. Um, yeah, I, I, I get, that was a mouthful, wasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Ok, a ver qué se puede hacer porque sí se está metiendo mucho el sonido, um, pero bueno. Carlos, um, can you mute, please? We'll be with you in a moment, Carlos. Oh. Toki? Um, okay. All right, so I'll go right ahead. So for me, when we talk about culture, you know, it will continue to be excluded from priority areas unless funding, funding, and I put funding in capital, you know, letters is adequately addressed. Uh, it cannot continue to be an underfunded field based on volunteerism. At some stage, people are going to get burned out. And I think before we can go further, we need to know where the money is going to come to deal with these issues. Um, in itself, it's not sustainable, just you know, based on people pushing it without the monetary aspects of it. Economics 101 for me, that is just a no-no, you know? And so for, for us to frame this, we need to frame it around circular cultural economics. Um, this needs to be part of a cultural impact assessment of some sort, and uh, which needs to be inclusive. Uh, we have to have inclusive voices as one of the major key elements of this. Culture still will be protected for its own sake, whether we like it or not, it will be protected. And one implication of this may mean that cultural conservation, management, interpretation, will continue to be considered a liability, you know, in other sectors as it is 
already the case with the SDGs um, 4. So to get culture to be considered holistically, attention has to be given to a wider landscape, right? So we have issues that are entangled in this. So I'll take for instance, uh, urbanization, um, inequalities. These are, um, where, these are places where circular um, cultural economics as a model can help propel culture into the life of community civil society in order for it to be sustainable. So using culture to address um, sustainable development challenges may still occur, but it has to be on a localized small scale basis. Publications that clarify the role of culture in addressing every single SDG. We see that already with the e-commerce policy guidelines and the work Ege has done, Sophia Lombardi has done, and those are very crucial in you know, guiding the principles in this process. That would be me answering the two questions. <laughs> Great, thank you for those crucial points and also for being um, very um, good with your time um, or under the time all allocated for now. Uh, great. Um, uh, all right, I'll, we'll see you later in a bit. And uh, okay. now we'll, uh, we'll now move on to um, Her Royal Highness um, Princess Dana Firas. Um, Princess Dana Firas is a global advocate for heritage protection and preservation as a foundation for sustainable development, responsible tourism, political identity, and peace. Her Royal Highness was a designated UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador in June to, um, since then, she, since um, June 2017. Uh, she's a UNESCO Goodwill Ambassador. She currently serves as President of the Jordan National Committee for ECOMOS. Uh, she's also President of the Petra National Trust, Jordan's oldest national non-governmental organization for heritage protection. She's a founding member of the boards of the Mohammed and Maharag Abu Ghazali, Foundation. Between 2016 and 2020, she served on the board of the Fulbright Commission in Jordan. And internationally, Princess Dana serves as chair of the board of the Petra National Foundation, a US-based 501c3 organization, and uh, serves as invited expert to the board of ICOMOS International, also as patron of the Friends of Manar El Athar, and ambassador for the UK-based International National Trusts Organization, INTO. Uh, so, um, Her Royal Highness, um, um, a, a high-level figure and a technical specialist, she's with us today to share her views uh, for these two questions for now. Uh, Your Highness, um, the floor is yours. Thank you, Ege, very much. Um, hello, everyone. It is a pleasure to be with you all from uh, Jordan. Um, you know, I, I, my thoughts intersect very much, um, uh, actually. Uh, with with probably all of the speakers, but but um, I, I have to say that as we look towards the 2030 agenda, I think um, we have to really reevaluate uh, uh, the shortfalls um, as a global community. Our plan of action, our benchmarks, our monitoring, and our accountability really have yet to catch up with our vision, with our vision for, for a 2030 and a post-2030 world. And I think I've outlined five um, general areas where I think moving forward, it is important to focus. And then I'll bring in the second part of the question as to where culture fits in. Um, the first one is sustainability. I think um, we have to ensure that anything that is consumed, produced, invested in, developed, in the economic, social, cultural, and environmental dimension must be in accordance with the principle of sustainability, a conscious, thoughtful, responsible approach that does not deplete or compromise the well-being of people and planet today and in the future. Equity is the second. Our actions have to embrace the principle of equity. This must hold true within and across countries as well as across all sectors. And there is a strong ethical dimension that pertains to justice and a rights-based approach here, as well as a practical dimension to develop policies, laws, and programs. My third is specificity. Um, again, it is important to consider the circumstances of different communities, sectors, and countries, and what specifically is needed to create the circumstances to achieve sustainability and equity. And here, values play an important role in defining what is important to each specific circumstance, what people care about. And there has to be an emphasis on investment in data, in research, in science, to guide specific policies and action in a very well-studied approach. 
My fourth is organization. And I want to say here that this is a focus on the sectors, the different sectors. And I feel that the world has really gone beyond a pure state-based approach. And our thinking has to reflect that. And there are many organizations playing incredible roles in the world today in the development um, space that have budgets larger than, than some countries. And so these organizations, small and big, must have a place at the table in formulating policies and affecting the global agenda. And finally, five, accountability. And this is where I bring in the money as well. And I agree completely with Toki that this is, um, th it is a difficult one because the SDG process is, is elective. How much is done, what specifically is done is up to each country. And so we have to really take another look to make the system more robust and more accountable. And I would also suggest that any financing for any project through any major donor pathways be tied to both an environmental and a cultural impact assessment. And how do you see culture fitting in? Do I have a couple of minutes, Ege, for this? Uh, you have uh, 40 seconds. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Well, I think I want to reverse that question because I don't think it's where culture fits in as, mat as much as without culture, none of this is possible. We cannot achieve sustainability or equity or even agree on the principles of action, let alone come into partnership to work on them. You know, the broad sweeping changes we have to make to our methods of production and consumption require that people everywhere have buy it. And this is where culture comes in. Culture is values. It helps us understand what motivates people, what is important to them. And the likely consequences of not doing this, of, of the difficulties that come with, for example, global climate change and its consequences and other things, we cannot do this without the culture-based um, uh, social safety nets, uh, social and community cohesion that is required. Again, culture brings in diverse perspectives. It gives people a seat at the table. It makes sure that our conversation and what follows is truly inclusive. Um, and then the, the idea of creativity and response to challenges. I mean, culture is the wellspring of innovation and, and creativity. And there's so much knowledge and adaptation techniques that, that we can bring into this conversation that is culture-based. Um, I'll stop so here because I don't want to go, go beyond my time. <laughs> so. Uh, so far, we're all right. Um, <laughs> I kind of moved to Toki's um, credits to this um, part, so we're fine. <laughs> Thank, you. thank you, Toki. <laughs> um, well, thank you um, for setting such a broad, comprehensive and you know, well-rounded perspective and also uh, putting culture straight in the um, center of, of that framework, uh, Your Highness. Uh, thank you very much um, for these words. Uh, so we'll see you again shortly. Um, and um, moving on to our next uh, panelist, uh, Mr. John Crowley. Um, John Crowley is the chairman and CEO of the PHGD Group, which brings together a cluster of companies addressing the various dimensions of consultancy on social transformations, as well as a range of renewable energy solutions. Before founding the group, he spent 18 years at UNESCO, leading the section for research policy and foresight from 2014 to 2021. He was previously responsible for ethics of science and technology and for global environmental change. He has published a further 100 academic articles and book chapters, mainly on political theory and comparative politics. Uh, so a uh, pleasure to have Mr. Crowley with us. Uh, dear John, the floor is yours for these two questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you to both previous speakers for some important points that I uh, very largely agree with, indeed entirely agree with. So I, I won't waste time repeating them. Because I'm perhaps less of a culture person, as my short CV shows, um, I'll take a slightly broader perspective. And I think the key, which the previous speaker also emphasized, is that it's not just a matter of fitting culture into a framework that is basically fine. There's a lot that needs to be criticized about the framework. It's probably a different framework that is needed in order to achieve, I think, what we could all agree is the ultimate aim, which is to place culture in the sustainable development agenda as a structuring principle. Uh, what would a culture of sustainable development look like? And in that respect, um, the very well-known deficiencies of uh, the existing 2030 agenda are probably in three areas. First, it's far too fragmented. And 
adding culture as a further aspect of fragmentation probably wouldn't be very productive. Culture, like science, which is another component that's largely missing from the 2030 agenda, is the ultimate transversal notion. Of course, there are specific issues to do with cultural policies and cultural industries. But culture taken in the broad sense is something that would need to run through the whole of a development agenda, a sustainable development agenda, in order to be part both of the background analysis of the challenges, of the specific goals and targets, perhaps even indicators to be achieved, and of course, of serious reflection about the uh, implementation mechanisms. So a more integrated agenda. Secondly, one of the clear problems with the existing 17 sustainable development goals feeding into uh, 369 uh, targets and who knows how many indicators is issues of prioritization. Um, it was a choice in 2015 not to try to prioritize in order to achieve maximum political involvement, so to speak, so that everyone could find something uh, that they could identify with. But the price for that has been a loss of focus on priority issues. And uh, any thinking about the role of culture should be also thinking about how to prioritize among things that need to be urgently achieved uh, in order to have something more uh, than uh, just a wish list. And um, finally, issues to do with flexibility are hugely important. This was mentioned by previous speakers. Um, creating a single wish list for the whole planet doesn't work particularly well. So there are choices, choices made perhaps in ways that are not entirely legitimate with respect to the framework itself, which is supposed to be integrated in particular by the full realization of human rights. Um, recognizing that flexibility is the flip side of prioritization. Recognizing that there are some things that the international community is committed to as a package of things from which no derogation is admissible, politically or morally, or even legally, since they're often based on prior legal commitments, but recognizing at the same time that there needs to be a framework to address things that particular states or non-state actors might care about within a shared framework, but not necessarily uh, binding everyone to the same notion of prioritization. If uh, you can rethink the post-2030 development agenda around those three principles of stronger integration, uh, more uh, flexibility, and uh, a better framework mechanism for prioritization, including changes of prioritization over time, then I think cultural issues will find a very natural home within both the high level language, what would a cultural sustainable development look like, framing issues around education and poverty and climate and oceans and everything else, and at the same time, last word, um, building in space for specific cultural issues to do with the cultural industries and cultural policy. Thank you so much, and John. Uh, quite um, time, um, good timekeeping as well. And thank you for reminding us of um, the importance of silo breaking and how um, we need to balance the fragmentation and prioritization issues. Um, so, uh, without um, uh, keeping you, I will now hand over um, the moderation to um, Jordi, who will uh, continue with our um, remaining panelists for this round. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ege. I will. I will now you. Uh, I will now introduce Carlos Villaseñor to the to our audience, and I will I will do it in Spanish. Carlos is a consultor international sobre políticas culturales y desarrollo sostenible, miembro del grupo de expertos de UNESCO sobre políticas culturales. Carlos ha participado en múltiples procesos sobre cultura y desarrollo sostenible, entre los cuales el Comité Asesor para la Cumbre de IFACA el Plan Estratégico de Industrias Culturales y Creativas de Iberoamérica para la CEGIP. Forma parte del grupo de expertos UNESCO SIDA en Gobernanza Cultural y Economía Creativa y además en el ámbito nacional mexicano ha participado en, en varias instancias destacando la Comisión Nacional de Patrimonio Cultural Inmaterial y anteriormente responsabilidades en, en Tlaxcala de cuyo Museo de Arte fue director fundador, también fue director general del Instituto Tlaxcalteca de Cultura uh, 
Carlos, tienes una, una visión completa desde lo global hasta lo local o desde lo local hasta lo, hasta lo, hasta lo global. Uh, y por tanto, te podemos plantear cuál crees que debe ser el marco del post-2030 y cómo ves a la cultura en este, en este marco. Tienes la palabra, Carlos. Muchas gracias y un gran saludo a todos. Es un honor estar con todos ustedes. Y yo soy probablemente pesimista o no sé si realista en cuanto a cómo veo el 2030. Es claro que en 1982 la UNESCO, los países, veían en el panorama el rompimiento de un mundo bipolar. Y eh, el gran cuestionamiento, la, la gran propuesta fue cómo hacer dialogar la diversidad cultural eh, que se visualizaba que emergería de este rompimiento del mundo bipolar. Eh, posteriormente, la Agenda 2030 nos habló sobre todo de la sostenibilidad en, un, en una situación de depredación acelerada que estábamos viendo venir. Hoy, yo para el 2030... Observo dos, dos puntos que me parecen eh, que determinarán el contexto de la Agenda 2030, que sería la 2050 en su, en su momento. Uno, que vamos a ver una, eh, un, grandes procesos de migración hacia espacios donde haya recursos naturales, producto del calentamiento global, de la sobreexplotación de los recursos naturales, etcétera. Vamos a ver migraciones inversas ya de los países eh, altamente desarrollados a los lugares donde haya accesibilidad a recursos naturales. En ese sentido veo un tremendo proceso de, de migración y por otra parte veo para el 2030 y aunque parece muy cercano y, y que pueda parecer exagerado, pero una enorme presencia, eh, una enorme presión por parte de los promotores de los metaversos para alejarnos desde lo local, de lo local, de los entornos sociales y ambientales con los que hemos vivido, ay perdón, con los que hemos vivido pues prácticamente toda la historia de la humanidad para llevarnos a vivir en, en estos metaversos que son absolutamente uniformes, que son eh, unívocos y donde perderemos mucho de la diversidad creativa de la especie humana. Me parece que el marco de referencia de la Agenda 2030 paradójicamente va a ser llevar estas eh, metas del desarrollo ya no a nivel global, ya no a nivel países, sino procurar que sea una agenda del desarrollo, pero desde lo local. Desde lo local, donde la cultura tendrá un papel fundamental. Hago énfasis en esta parte de la cultura eh, como derecho humano, como la capacidad que nosotros, o el derecho que tenemos cada uno de nosotros a acceder a estos contenidos simbólicos que nos permiten describirnos a nosotros mismos como personas, comunicarnos con los otros, construir acuerdos y, eh, y desarrollar proyectos en conjunto como humanidad. Nos enfrentamos en los próximos 10, 20 años a este gran reto, cómo reconstruirnos, cómo reformularnos, cómo reinterpretarnos como personas y cómo hacerlo desde un contexto de lo local que garantice, que promueva la diversidad de la, de creativa de la especie humana para brincar este gran reto de la, de la escasez de recursos, de eh, las tendencias a llevarnos a, a los metaversos, y desde allí, eh, desde el fracaso que, que, que significará todo este problema de eh, excesiva extracción, de recursos naturales del único planeta que tengamos, aprender a partir de lo cultural, a partir de los contenidos simbólicos, a dialogar desde lo local y a reinventarnos desde allí. Muy eh, bien. Creo que ese es el reto, mi querido Jordi. Muy bien, gracias, Carlos. En la segunda, en la segunda ronda te, te dirigiremos una pregunta más específica sobre, sobre, sobre estos temas. Uh, pero quedan apuntadas tus, tus aportaciones. Muy interesante el marco general que planteas y también esta referencia al derecho a participar en la vida cultural. 
which I am I'm sure the next speaker will also also consider. Alessandra Shantaki, the, the UN Special Rapporteur in the field of cultural rights, professor of laws at Brunel University. She was appointed UN Special Rapporteur in October last year. And through her academic career, uh, Dr. Shantaki has published over 50 publications relating to the cultural rights of minorities and indigenous peoples, mm -hmm. cultural diversity, cultural heritage, balancing cultural rights with other rights and interests, and multiculturalism and integration in international human rights law. She has worked with NGOs, civil society, and has consulted states on such issues. Thank you very much, Alessandra Santaki. Uh, the question, the question for, for you is, what for you should characterize the post-2030 development framework? Welcome. Uh, thank you. Um, it's it's lovely to to see you again, but also it's lovely to see uh, several familiar faces by now. And um, looking forward to further collaborations. And thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I think that um, um, for me, um, culture has not achieved yet what um, one would hope to be achieved in um, uh, in development. Uh, I think that we still have a very long way to go. Um, and, and this question that, uh, you know, whether um, culture runs through all um, SDGs, um, maybe it does, but uh, still in human rights, we still talk about, um, when we talk about development, we, we focus on socioeconomic rights. So unfortunately, I haven't seen a lot of focus on cultural rights. Cultural rights continue to be the Cinderella of human rights. And I think that, and, and I would also argue uh, the Cinderella uh, in development. So um, I think that uh, one of the uh, priorities should be to recognize and elevate um, the status, uh, the importance and recognize the importance and elevate the status of culture in, um, in the post-2030 um, uh, agenda. Um, and and uh, we see still that development is being discussed in very Western terms and very much as a Western concept. Um, and, and we see that the, the priorities that uh, the previous speaker um, very uh, interestingly talked about are very much set by um, the developed um, states and uh, the, the um, may I also argue, the civil society of the global north uh, to a very large degree. Um, the, the civil society of the global south are seen as the victims that um, are going to follow um, and, and their um, voices are, um, are not being uh, heard uh, directly. So I think that one of the major priorities is to recognize, first of all, the importance that, um, and, and the different elements that uh, culture offers in development. Um, and it's not just about cultural practices, it's about um, um, Cosmo theories of, uh, about development and the world, etc. Uh, and goes much beyond um, human rights, of course. Uh, it's about philosophies and, and um, um, of course, priorities. And, and the second would be exactly what I said about participation. And I can see that uh, participation of um, and participation rights in, in development is um, are, are really something that we should talk a lot more about. And coming from my own background, indigenous rights have made a very big um, have had a very big push through when it comes to uh, participation rights and consultation rights with uh, the FPIC, the free prior informed consent, the guarantee that now um, has been is, is considered like a, a emerging uh, customer international law. I will remind you that the World Bank now um, uh, recognizes FPIC for indigenous groups. I would also remind you that from um, FPIC of indigenous group um, peoples, we also now recognize um, the, the need to, um, to ensure um, free prior informed consent of local populations. Um, in the Declaration on Peasants, also um, peasants now are recognized the guarantee of FPIC. So I think that um, the participation and consultation is something that we have to be very um, aware of and something that we have to focus on in the post-2030 um, uh, uh, agenda. And of course, when we talk about participation, cultural rights and cultural diversity are very much at the core of this uh, participation and, and um, uh, consultation. Um, 
And in essence, is um, uh, we talked with um, um, Joan um, earlier from the United Nations, who is also attending, and and we were talking about this. And Joan said that really what what we talk about is about subsidiarity. So you, you know the 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 first um, level, the ground. Um, um, the, the people on the ground are the ones that have to take the decisions um, first, and then the rest of us have to um, respect their wishes and their decisions rather than the other way uh, around. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Alessandra Santaki. Uh, we, we will have the opportunity, you will have the opportunity to interact, uh, because I think that this concept you have just used, subsidiarity, uh, not with the same uh, wording, but it has been uh, in all of you, uh, your first uh, uh, speeches. Ege, you, you continue. Uh, okay, sure. Um, that was a very stimulating first round. Thank you, um, everyone, um, indeed. Uh, for our second round, um, our second um, two uh, questions um, are, how much does it matter that culture is the subject of a dedicated goal? And what elements would you see as featuring in such a goal? So um, again, in the same order, um, I will uh, give the floor to Toki uh, to reflect on these questions. With a, five, with, with a one minute bonus for, for her uh, short uh, oh, yes. speech. We can still do that. <laughs> okay. Um, a dedicated goal, should we say uh, goal zero? because that's the base point in which we're trying to um, push this, or do we say goal 18? I have no idea at the moment, <laughs> but it's a springboard, you know, it's a springboard to sort of push this thought. And I do agree with the speakers that um, in order for this to move forward, we do need a lot of diverse voices you know, as part of this, right? And so, yes, participation is key. So cultural diversity, cultural economics, um, acknowledging culture as one of the pillars when it comes to sustainable development is also key in addressing um, this dedication. And also, again, I will always go back to funding because I do understand how this affects, especially from Africa, where data is an issue, um, where just having accessibility is also an issue. And so without adequate funding, because we have to understand that cultural heritage practitioners are the first custodians on the ground. And when there is no money, no money at all to and force this accessibility to be on the, and when you lose the first custodians, it's just going to be a repetition of what is going on at the moment where we have a particular group dictating what culture is. And that's what is making part of, that's what help, you know, works on policies and that's what dictates what happens and what is trickled down again to the first custodians on the ground. And so, so we need to be able to reverse this. And if we're truly serious about culture, <laughs> it means that we need to understand that there are certain groups of people that haven't reached that point where, what's that um, pyramid um, thing, they, the Maslow um, um, scale of pyramid? They haven't reached there. We have to understand that. And so, culture <laughs> is the linkage to a lot of things and it needs to be sustainable and to be able to have it as a dedicated goal we need to have everybody at that table everyone and which means no one is left behind no one literally no one is left behind and as participants on this table it's a matter of looking at who's not there and saying this person is not here I'm not going ahead until this person is here. This person is represented or this region is represented or this sector is represented or this vector is represented. And we're all not moving forward until everyone is at the table. And we're all listening to everybody at that table because you're going to have people that are not going to agree with this. We're also going to have people that 
are for cancel culture. And so we need to be able to understand that there are some people that would not toe the line and there are some people that will, and there are some people that will come with something completely different. And how are we going to manage all of these challenges is key to seeing how this goes post 2030. Have I finished my four minutes or not? I am ready to dedicate the remaining part of that. <laughs> you, ha you have not actually. So if you have anything you'd like to add, you know, um, um, please do. I'm more of an action person. Unless <laughs> <it is. laughs> Concise so, words and then um, acting on those words you're saying. <laughs> you see, so I, I guess that for us to see this as a goal, I, um, I'm all for it. At the same time, I'm a bit um, hesitant because I see how um, when I'm on the ground in Africa, I see just how this is quite limiting and it's difficult to, um, to convince people that yes, that um, views will be um, represented. And then there's also this whole issue of um, international experts coming in to talk to people as custodians that are already doing the job, but they are the ones who have the funding, the salaries, the jobs and everything. And they come with this shining bright light and they are just like, okay, we've been doing this for eons. We don't see this funding. Do we give you our knowledge and then you're gone and then you publish and you are this. And then it's, it's also the same issue with those in the diaspora as well. So it's not just international experts, it's also those in the diaspora that have the jobs who go back with these ideas, but they're not on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so you're going back to the ground and you're giving this whole input from the Western perspective, because let's face it, that's where you're living, right? And so the challenges that are being faced, it's not the same as those that are on the ground. Mm -hmm. And so we repeat the same thing over again, and then we come back thinking that we we're, we've been given the, um, the key to go represent. Yeah. And then again, we lose that, we lose that because they themselves are not at the table. This, this ties us in into the localization issue very well, I think. Uh, yes. These are supposed to be localized and how to ground yes. them in, in, yes, in context. Yeah, yes. thank you very much. Um, and now I need to um, cut you off, but uh, these were really valuable additions. Thank you uh, great, um, for your energy. Um, and actually we have uh, some, some really great question points coming up. And um, I'm also um, checking the chat box and there are really interesting comments there. So far, we don't seem to have any um, questions um, uh, accumulating here. There's one from Rosanna Lewis, but uh, um, I could advise some of uh, you to actually transfer your comments from the chat box into question mode in the Q&A, so we can also address them in, in the next round, please, um, everybody. Uh, yeah, so thank you very much again. And on to our next panelist again, um, Her Royal Highness, uh, Dana Firas. Um, uh, please, the floor is yours for these questions as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ege. Um, you know, I, I completely agree with, with um, the repre representation um, uh, issue here and, and with the fact that, that um, the value of the various and the diverse voices has to be recognized in, in its totality. Um, but I, I, do, I am biased towards the adoption of, of a goal. Um, and I've been calling for that for many years now. Um, and I'm rather biased to, to a goal 18 as opposed to a goal zero, but happy to accept any name as long as there's a, there's a dedicated goal. And I, I'll tell you why. I think visually it matters because symbolism matters. And a dedicated goal actually implies and demonstrates that there is a recognition of the equal importance of culture in the development agenda. And even when this importance is, is sort of indisputable around certain discussion tables, without a dedicated goal, this is not reflected in a more general outlook in the global development agenda. And for those of us who work in the field, we're constantly having to explain why culture matters, why voices matter. And I think just having that symbolism would be very, very important. 
In addition, I um, quite, you know, many reports, including the Culture of 2020 reports, have concluded that the sustainable development uh, framework and the monitoring and the accountability do not actually capture culture as well as they do, or the impact of culture across the different development goals. I mean, I, I, I have seen two direct references in goal four, 4.7 and, and 11, 11.4. That's not nearly enough. And, and sort of as we've, in you know, a culture plays a role in every one of the goals. It is a critical component of getting the buy-in, of mobilizing action. Uh, I mean, they're so complicated and, and so multifaceted and we need to engage with these difficult issues, with the issues of voice, with the issues of inclusivity, of representation, of you know, knowledge that is not has not been recognized as important in, in the frameworks that is important and needs to have that space. And I think that's why um, I'm, I'm fully for for a, a goal. Um, and I also believe if that if there is a goal, we are more likely to see governments, decision makers, other actors commit to to culture and to including culture and the promotion of culture as an integral component of the development agenda. Um, and in terms of what can be featured in such a goal, I think, you know, again, science, data, cultural parameters have to be developed, have to be set out, um, they have to be international, they have to be cross sectors, um, culture based policies that pertain to each of the SDGs um, with independent and specific measurements and monitoring parameters. Um, we have to be able to measure and follow what culture-based actions, programs, solutions are being implemented across the SDGs. All periodic reports have to have a culture-based component by, by, you know, as a requirement. Um, we have to be able to measure total per capita expenditure on culture, on preservation, on protection, on um, you know, where is the funding coming from? Where is it going? What, at what level of government, what agencies? Um, and I think we also have to be able to measure expenditure on components of intangible cultural heritage. Um, and so I think also, again, I agree that the financial system has to be um, mobilized to, to um, pour resources into, into culture, into cultural organizations on the ground, um, into culture impact assessments, and into voices that um, you know, create this more inclusive, more representative space that can impact policies, pro actions, and, and, and uh, priorities um, of moving forward. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Um, actually, if I may add um, something to that point you made about um, the different kinds of um, indicators or um, facets of cultural impact measurement, um, and you mentioned expenditure, 11.4, um, um, the cultural heritage target, the, mo the most clear culture related target we have, has expenditure as an indicator, but it's by far not enough is what everybody's saying. And uh, actually our campaign has recently done um, a report on uh, voluntary local reviews. And we see local governments have so many different kinds of indicators um, to offer. So uh, there's a lot of interesting potential work to, done, to do there. So um, thank you very much and, um, and now, um, I will uh, stop talking and uh, give um, the floor to Jordi to continue this round. Maybe. Yes, but I will immediately give the floor to, to John. John, you have, you have followed from very close the, the building of the, of the SDGs. Uh, how much does it matter that culture is the subject of dedicated goal? And what elements would you see as featuring in such a goal? The floor is yours. Thanks. Um... In the current framework of the 2030 agenda, it matters enormously. As someone said in the chat, if something's just in the preamble, then for all practical purposes, it doesn't exist. And here, the parallel between culture and science is, is very clear and very enlightening. Culture and science are paid lip service to, but not integrated into the framework, even though everyone knows they have a crucial role. On the other hand, um, we probably need a different kind of framework that is more integrated and doesn't depend on that level of fragmentation. So there's a kind of balancing actor. Clearly, um, in the, if the framework was extended in its current form, then you would want to add a specific culture goal. And perhaps even if the framework was itself modified, you would want to do so. And that specific goal would clearly need to deal at the minimum 
uh, with the four main things that have already been referred to by previous speakers, which are kind of the recognized dimensions of cultural policy challenges in relation to development within uh, existing international legal frameworks and other policies, heritage, creativity, exchange, diversity. And on each of them, of course, some combination of efforts indicators, uh, indicators about what states and non-state actors are actually doing to achieve those objectives, and outcome indicators uh, that uh, give some idea of what's actually being achieved. We know that efforts don't always deliver outcomes, and we know that sometimes outcomes be, can be serendipitous. But if you do it that way, you're leaving so much out that is of vital importance. I really liked uh, the framing that Carlos proposed earlier, where ultimately the question beyond 2030 is, what does it mean to be human in a world of environmental crisis, uh, increasing solidarity, massive social change, um, and uh, living with increasingly complex and perhaps even intelligent technologies. And if we want to have a framing of the question of sustainable development beyond 2030 that fully recognizes all its cultural dimensions, then it's not gonna be reducible to an individual goal or set of targets or indicators. It's also going to need to be properly mainstreamed in consideration of technological issues, uh, production and consumption issues, energy, oceans, climate, everything uh, you, you want to name. And in order for the future agenda to take account of these cross-cutting unifying issues more effectively, it's going to need to be a different kind of agenda, not just one that adds goals to the existing framework. That would be my, uh, my view of the matter. Thank you very much. Extremely interesting, John. Thank you very much for this for this uh, input, Carlos. Uh, what would you say? ¿Cómo responderías a estas a estas dos preguntas? Uh, Importa mucho tener un objetivo cultura. Mira, y, eh, y si es así, si importara mucho, uh, ¿qué elementos pondrías en este en este objetivo? Mira. Eh, eh, me parece, recordarás que estuvimos en el 2013 en Hansu, donde mucho de esto comenzó. Así me parece es. Así que es. ha habido allí un problema eh, con la definición de, de un objetivo de cultura. Me parece que el gran temor de los países ha sido que eh, se piense que un objetivo de cultura es poner como objetivo el empoderamiento, la visibilización o la realización de una serie de expresiones culturales de un bagaje específico, es decir, eh, de un patrimonio cultural, de expresiones artísticas, eh, de festividades, de un modelo de desarrollo específico y que esa cultura como contenido, fuere la que se pensara como objetivo. Me parece que es un buen momento para repensar el objetivo de cultura, ya no como contenido, sino como proceso, como mecanismo a partir del cual, eh, como bien mencionaba John, eh, construirnos como personas. Y lo que mencionaba Toki me llamó mucho la atención, en esta palabra de representación, creo que durante muchos años hemos sido representados y te hemos dependido de otros para conseguir esa capacidad de ser representados o de ser reconocidos como productores de conocimiento. Y en ese sentido, lo cultural nos permite ser protagonistas de nuestra propia, de nuestra propia acción hacia la construcción de sociedad. Porque yo estoy claro que cuando hacemos un castel, cuando hacemos un carnaval, cuando hacemos una procesión religiosa, una representación, mucho más allá de lo artístico, lo que estamos haciendo es construir sociedad, es dialogar, es ponernos de acuerdo, es jerarquizar nuestras necesidades, es reconocer valores compartidos, ya sea, insisto, a través de un carnaval, de un festival, de una expresión artística. Entonces, me parece que en el 
marco de referencia que estaba proponiendo yo de ya la necesidad de reconstruir el desarrollo desde lo local y más que grandes metas globales o nacionales, promover objetivos del desarrollo para construir sostenibilidad desde lo local, allí el objetivo de acceder a, la, a, a las expresiones culturales como medio para reconstruirnos como persona estaría, sería el objetivo número uno, porque nosotros estaríamos redefiniendo en este nuevo parámetro, en este nuevo paradigma, qué es trabajo decente, qué es conservar la naturaleza, qué son las industrias. ¿Sí me explico? Entonces, el primer objetivo sería, a ver, cómo, cómo garantizamos que las personas tengan la mayor libertad cultural para elegir aquellos contenidos simbólicos que les permitan en esta realidad tan catastrófica reconstruirse como personas, dialogar con su entorno inmediato y reconstruir el significado de lo que es lo social y los objetivos de lo social. Yo espero estar absolutamente equivocado y que dentro de unos años digan, oye Carlos, este, no tuviste nada de razón y al contrario, encontramos fácilmente ya formas pacíficas de relación que nos permitieron sortear estas crisis, pero con lo que estoy viendo en la prensa en estos días, me parece difícil que lo hagamos y creo que eh, mi comentario sería ese, la, el, el acceso a los contenidos simbólicos para ser personas estaría como el primer objetivo de desarrollo 2050, y eh, sus contenidos serían espacios de diálogo, espacios de intercambio, marcos de libertad de expresión, capacidad de eh, generar marcos jurídicos y administrativos para la innovación, para la creatividad. Por allí, por allí sería mucho pues, de lo que ya eh, la, agenda de la Agenda 21 tiene como, como objetivos desde lo local, ¿no? Muchas gracias, Carlos. Lo que dices me, me recuerda mucho a los trabajos que las anteriores relatoras especiales de Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Culturales han, han, han escrito uh, y, y, y me encanta pues pasarle ahora la, la pregunta, casi la misma pregunta al actual titular, uh, to Alexandra Shantaki. Uh, Dr. Shantaki, how much does it matter that culture is the subject of a dedicated law? Yes, I think that I will agree with the previous speakers. I, I would like to see culture as a as a specific uh, goal, and and um, um, and and I don't understand why we should be just a binary. Why should it be only as a single goal and kind of mainstreamed in the other goals? So, for example, gender. Yep. So, for example, gender. We have gender in. Uh, <laughs> uh, um, gender as a single goal and at the same time we have gender you know nobody's going to say that gender should not be mainstreamed in all the other goals so i think that you know this is this is important and the reason why i'm saying this is that um theoretically it is a good idea that indeed culture should be um should be run across all the goals but um uh, has it been Um, so, for example, let's take poverty, you know, as a goal. Has culture been included in the realization of, um, in the considerations when poverty is realized? We still focus very much on the monetary exchange and, you know, how monetary um, living uh, culture is focused on an economic model, the uh, rather than on a on a, a more inclusive uh, model, a model that would also allow exchange of products and not just monetary exchange. So, you know, I don't think that we have seen it, it's it's a good idea and it would be good if it worked but i don't think that we have seen really can, culture being um there in the re realization of the other sdgs so for this reason so this is the first reason the second reason the third reason is that uh, i think that um it has exactly like the previous speaker said it has so much content that you know if you push them in the other um in in the other um sdgs then some of its content is being lost and and you ask me you know how what would i see as the content and i think that it is very important um not to reinvent the wheel i think that the human rights framework is giving us a really good basis and what i keep saying is that i really don't think that it is productive to come up with new instruments 
um, sometimes concepts and terms that can become quite interesting, but but push um, push us away from the existing human rights framework. So the existing human rights framework has recognized a number of, of issues. So, you know, I completely agree with what Carlos said, for example, I see in my work that there is this emphasis very much on, on um, still, um, amazingly, on, on states emphasize the individualistic approach to culture. So, so the artistic, um, uh, maybe more artistic freedom, they're more um, kind of open to artistic freedom, they're more open to this debate about, you know, culture and how this can have an impact on yeah, um, individual rights such as um, um, uh, women's rights and and they don't pay enough attention to the other um, standards um, of cultural rights such as the collective um, aspects of cultural rights such as um, intangible culture such as natural culture recently so I think that you know human rights the human rights framework is evolving and has um, democratized the concept of culture and I think it's very important that we all you know stick with the uh, standards if 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 not try to push them forward, stick with um, the standards and, and um, expect and demand that any content of this um, SDG culture, or if you want cultural rights, um, would, um, would, would have all the elements that international human rights standards would, um, uh, would, would see. Great, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, Alessandra Santaki. Um, Ege, I, I give the floor now to you for the, for the next slot. Um, thank you, Jordi. We did have, <clears throat> sorry, uh, we did have um, a slot of further reactions from the speakers. Um, we will need to um, shorten it a little bit. Um, uh, so perhaps um, if any of our panelists would like to make um, any further comments, maybe one minute long comments, so we can maybe wrap up in five minutes um, and move on to the audience questions. Um, I will try to go by uh, rounds again. Toki, um, would you like to add any uh, response to what's been said in, just now? Uh, yeah, I, I, especially the metaverse. I like the fact that Carlos brought that up. And um, one of the issues I find with the metaverse is that, um, like everything, as human beings, we sort of like to disconnect ourselves from source. And I think the metaverse will be an avenue where we do connect from source and then we, we feel less obligated to care about what's going on around us as we continue to find ourselves in a different plane. And so how is this going to affect the whole issue of culture is something that we need to actually look at and look at fast. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> yes. Thank Very you good. So, much. Um, so um, your Royal Highness, Princess Dana, what would you like to add? I, I you know, I, I have, I think I will I will cede my time to to the next speaker and and we'll wait until we start the discussions. Um, All right, thank you, uh, John. Uh, would you like to um, comment on anything right now? Yeah, just two comments um, in in support of things said previously that I think are hugely important. As someone who used to work for UN specialized agency, I would really like to uh, emphasize Alexandra's plea not to try and invent new agendas at the same time as you're lobbying for their inclusion. There is a sufficiently rich existing normative framework. That doesn't mean that new work can't be done, but if it's done, it will be done in parallel and it will come in later. Now the issue is to actually honor commitments already made, whether on heritage, on diversity, on uh, participation in cultural life or on uh, cultural exchange. Mm -hmm. uh, and the second point I wanted to make is that the transversality is already there. Uh, let me just take one example to, to illustrate. Food. Food systems are reflected in the Sustainable Development Goals, though, though perhaps not sufficiently because they're scattered across several. But food is the ultimate cultural uh, process and product. Um, a cultural angle on food is absolutely indispensable. Food and food systems is absolutely indispensable to achieve sustainable development culture being both part of the problem because cultures of unsustainable food production and consumption have emerged and part of the solution 
because it is through culture that sustainable uh, food production and consumption systems will emerge. So whatever's done in terms of the specifics of cultural policies, cultural rights, and cultural practices, that transversal um, thrust of culture is hugely important and currently missing. Thanks. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Um, Carlos, um, uh, I'm so sorry, I don't speak Spanish. I'm going to have to ask in English. Would you like to add anything? Um, please feel free to speak in Spanish. There's interpretation. Estás muteado, Carlos. Ahora. Me parece que con lo que hemos hablado, sí, Mundiacult debería eh, abrir un espacio de seria reflexión sobre eh, esta cuestión de incorporar la conveniencia de incorporar un eh, objetivo específico en materia de cultura desde la perspectiva que hemos comentado y donde haya eh, una gran participación de las organizaciones de la sociedad civil porque eh, si sí, el ejercicio de el ejercicio de los derechos humanos el ejercicio de los derechos eh, culturales en concreto debe debe estar protagonizando mucho las discusiones sobre todo por lo que estamos viendo de la importancia que está adquiriendo lo local en, eh, en la construcción del desarrollo desde lo propio no Gracias, Carlos. Thank you, gracias. So, <clears throat> sorry. Um, and Alexandra, um, would you like to also um, add anything further? No, I'm just really looking forward to the discussion. I want to save uh, time for the discussion. Thank you. All right. Uh, pleasure. Thank you very much. Uh, well, in this case, uh, we have um, finished our uh, rounds of questions and, um, from the panelists, and <clears throat> now we can move on to a very rich um, set of uh, comments and questions from our um, attendees today. Uh, now uh, they have accumulated in the Q&A box and uh, we will also um, go through them, but I believe um, we would like to give the floor to um, have two minute interventions from uh, some um, of our attendees who requested it. Um, so I think um, that we can start with um, Justin O'Connor. Um, you have been writing prolifically in the chat box. Um, is Justin upgraded to um, speak as a panelist already? Are you here, Justin? He's, he's coming. Just just, just seeing him uh, up, upgraded to the to the room. Are I you? Think... Yes, here he is, Justin. Welcome. Hi. Sorry. I... I was chatting because I didn't think I would get through to the panel. So thank you for that. Um, well, I, I just wanted to say a little bit more about what I said in the Q&A box. Uh, 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 and it's my real problem with the idea of creative industry and the way it's used uh, within these discussions. Um, uh, uh, many agencies and UNESCO is one of them but, and most of the most of the national cultural organizations really rest a lot of their ideas of culture and development on the creative industries and there are real problems with that term and it's i i really do not know how we can go on into a new agenda of culture and sustainable development in the way the sdgs imagine whilst we hold on to creative uh, the idea of creative economy and, and I've said some of that in the chat but it, it it's conceptually incoherent um, you know we we nobody knows what the creative economy means nobody can pin it down we pull out statistics from the Augusta Rise has pulled out some statistics on various things what they're counting we don't really know can count many different things people on computers people working in you know textile industry it's hard to say but really, it, the, the more serious thing is that it, creative economy is a direct kind of uh, invention to economize culture. And however we dress it up and sprinkle stardust on it, that's what it is. It's a reduction of culture to a, a certain economic mo model. And when I say economics, I don't just mean the economy in the widest sense of 
resources and resource distribution. I mean, a particular form of neoclassical, and we could call it neoliberal economics about the maximization of profit, sovereign consumers, on creative entrepreneurs, etc. So I don't, I'll just pull it. I just think that until we start addressing that really seriously and, and beginning to unpick the creative economy and link it to new forms of sustainable economic development, models around heterodox economics, new forms of kind of well-being, uh, benvivir economics, uh, uh, feminist and, and, and uh, uh, ecologically founded economics, unless we start to do that, we're just gonna, we're gonna have a cuckoo in the nest. We're gonna take that model with us and it will constantly interrupt our ability to say, how do we go forward with culture seen as a public good, as part of public service, not as an economic driver? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you very much. Great um, point to um, dwell on. Um, would um, any panelists uh, like to respond or would Justin, do you have a particular panelist you'd like to um, um, comment on what you said? No, I'd like to see what how people felt about that, really. Um, well, um, we could um, have a response now um, or um, later um, at, in the final words. Um, I'll just give a few seconds to see any reactions. Please speak up. I can't see everyone. Um, otherwise, uh, we'll move on and make a note of that. But uh, thank you so much about um, how we shouldn't pigeonhole culture into just an economic concern. It's uh, very um, essential. Thank you so much. I thought he wants to say something, and I'd be happy to say something too. I don't know if you can see us waving our hands. Oh, sorry. And Alexandra too. All right, then. Uh, well, please, Toki, go ahead. I, I, um, Justin, I think we should blame Florida for that um, whole creative industry uh, drive and um, why, uh, why governments are, you know, proactively. There's a freeze. Yeah. Talking. Doing, and it's again, it's an issue of uh, profit before people. Hmm. Toki? Uh, we have a small connection problem. I think. We have a yes. We have a connection issue with with. Am I with... back? Uh, yes, but we missed some, a lot of what you just said. Um, could you okay. please summarize it again? Uh, okay. So uh, what I was trying to say is we have to thank Florida for um, driving this whole creative industry uh, propaganda and why governments have taken this to a whole different level, and and this is the issue of always understanding that we have to put people before profit. And this is why cultural economics is important because it looks at that. And this is why circular economics is also important because it means that it's coming from the community, it's going around within the communities. They are the driving force of this particular type of economics. And until we address that, you are very correct. We're going to continue with lobbyists trying to hijack this whole idea and using it as a profit making mechanism. That would be my um, contribution. Okay, thank you so much. Um, John? Yeah, just a small comment on that. Um, I think uh, Justin raised a really important point. Going back to um, the way in which UNESCO between 2012 and 2014 tried to push the idea of a culture goal in the SDGs, it was clear that a choice was made pragmatically to focus on the cultural industries, which was the standard term back then, rather than the created economy, but referring basically to the same thing, because of the belief, which turned out to be wrong, that that would get past the objections from various parts and parties uh, to an emphasis on culture and the SDGs. So there was a choice there, and I tend to agree that it was probably not a very good choice. And just going back to what I was saying earlier, if the price to pay for culture to have its own sustainable development goal is to set it within that framework, then it's probably not a price worth paying. Hence the need from a cultural perspective, both to push for the inclusion of culture, but also to push for a cultural wedge, so to speak, to rethink the agenda as a whole. And it's difficult to ride those two horses at the same time. Uh, some people can do that, but they're in circuses. Most people, if they're trying to ride two horses at the same time, fall off. But nonetheless, it has to be tried. 
and maybe we need the right kind of acrobats to make it to make it feasible. We all have to stretch ourselves in these days. <laughs> we have a big mission with culture. Yes, um, and 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 in fact, Mondia Cult is is a very good opportunity to to see how the acrobatics, uh, how good we are in acrobatics, and how good UNESCO is in acrobatics. Right. Okay, sorry for taking the floor. No, no, it's fine. Uh, Carlos um, would like to um, interject, please, for Carlos. Eh, uh, haciendo un poco de memoria, Mundial Cult 82 hacía uh, referencia a las industrias culturales, a la economía de la cultura, en el sentido de que ya se observaba que eran los canales privilegiados a través de los cuales eh, circularían los contenidos simbólicos y por eso hacía un llamado a los países en condiciones de desarrollo para fortalecer sus industrias culturales, pero no desde el aspecto, punto de vista económico, sino como medio de la circulación de los contenidos de lo propio, eh, de hacer circular los elementos de su autonomía cultural y de su libertad cultural. Sin embargo, eh, eh, y esto se fortaleció mucho con los informes 2008 y 2010 eh, de, que, que hablaban de las exportaciones y las importaciones de bienes culturales en el momento donde hubo el estallido de la digitalización. Pero hoy eh, las economías de la cultura, lo que se llama economía creativa, Se ha, vuelto, se ha transformado radicalmente. Hoy las exportaciones y las importaciones han variado radicalmente, ya no son bienes, son flujos electrónicos deslocalizados de centros de, de producción con eh, muchas complejidades y si le añadimos las criptomonedas, bueno, ¿qué les puedo decir? Pero en el fondo, y yo ahí quiero retomar lo que dice... Justin, a ver, hoy qué significan las industrias creativas, las industrias culturales, nos enfrentamos seriamente, creo que nos estamos enfrentando a muchos, a muchas redefiniciones de conceptos esenciales en el siglo XX y de inicios del siglo XXI, pero que están cambiando absolutamente su significado, no solo la economía creativa, hace rato Alexandra hablaba del género, a ver, perdón, en el metaverso, ¿cuál es el significado de género? Creo que estamos llegando a un momento donde precisamente, por eso hago hincapié en este aspecto de acceder a contenidos simbólicos para explicarnos y, y relacionarnos con el mundo, estamos en un momento donde nos acercamos a redefinición de conceptos básicos de nuestra existencia como personas. Es, yo lo veo así de dramático y no sé si Alexandra lo vea Igual desde, desde su perspectiva, mucho más amplia que la que yo tengo, ¿no? Gracias. Thank you. What does Alexandra think about that? Very quickly, <laughs> please. Alexandra cannot answer that, and certainly not in two minutes. <laughs> but actually, um... <laughs> we are. Um, we, we do need to actually um, um, move move on to the oh. next audience questions. Um, but uh, Frances Dana has also raised her hand. Um, but can I? No, no, no. Can I just oh, say oh. very quickly? <laughs> Alexandra is a typical lawyer. Cannot answer that, but she's going to try. <laughs> um, so, so, so what I wanted to say is that I think that I I agree with um, uh, Carlos that. Um, uh, First of all, this is what I meant when I talked about the democratization of culture, that, you know, culture is not just about, you know, the Parthenon marbles and the great, um, um, uh, the great art. And, and we have to see beyond, beyond that. Not that it's not that, but it's more than that. But I think that what is important from my point of view is not to get into endless discussions about definition that is very that is a, a very important discussion but i have seen in minority rights and in the indigenous rights that states want to get to these discussions when they want to stall any progress on standards and on issues so that's why yes of course let's discuss the different aspects of culture but i think that in the in the international level i always try not to get into the the definitions because i know that for a lot of states this is the point to to stop the debate the the dialogue rather than uh, continue it oh, yes thank you, thank you. 
talking about acrobatics, we have to be aware of other acrobatics. <laughs> um, please, uh, Your Highness Princess Dana. Um. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to say that I do agree. I do agree with Justin and I do agree with Toki. However, as, some, as a practitioner in the field and, and coming from a developing country that is struggling very much with, with fundamental issues of employment, of growth, of um, uh, just meeting basic needs in, 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 in some places. We, I mean, I resort to the concept of the cultural industries myself, simply to speak the language that I think my government needs to understand to put culture on the agenda. And so it, in, in, in many ways, it is not, um, exclusive to a definition that is that is accepted, but merely a way through which we can begin the process of dialogue um, with, with those that are making the decisions in many of these places. And I think focusing on a goal, um, dedicated goal through Mondiacol, through, through the various means will enable us to put these definitions, these, these issues um, up for discussion bringing in various perspectives, redefining what it means for, for people, for the future, and given all of the changes. I mean, I think the, the process of, of putting it through the SDG um, agenda, through a goal, enables us to really debate the complexities of this issue. But at the same time, speaking the language that my own government speaks, which is one of numbers, to be in any way successful, to put culture on any national priority agenda, I have to speak the money language, whether I like it or not. I mean, mm. yes, absolutely. Very good point. Also, uh, we, we're having an extraordinary uh, debate. And let, let me uh, invite Pablo Rafael de la Madrid, uh, the el director general de Relaciones Internacionales del Gobierno. De, de México, un estado uh, importante en el sistema de Naciones Unidas, pero además el anfitrión de Mundia Cult más, más 40. Pablo Rafael, tienes, tienes la palabra para preguntas, comentarios, observaciones. Gracias por estar aquí. Muchísimas gracias. Muchas, muchas gracias, Jordi. Voy a, voy a hablar en español, si me eh, disculpan, porque lo puedo hacer de manera más fluida, porque me pusieron... Pues muy nervioso, pero también muy eh, entusiasta. Yo soy el encargado del equipo organizador en términos técnicos de Mundiacul más 40. Eh, y cuando escucho este tipo de participaciones, eh, me vienen a la cabeza dos preocupaciones. Y, y son preocupaciones muy prácticas que tienen que ver con el design thinking de Mundiacult. Y que cuando los eh, escucho, eh, les quisiera contar primero que eh, Mundiacult, pues, se está entendiendo no como una fecha de llegada el 28 de septiembre de este año, sino como un proceso donde el planteamiento principal es no podemos pensar un Mundiacul más 40 o un Mundiacul 2022 sin considerar eh, la participación de los agentes culturales, de las eh, organizaciones no gubernamentales, de los creadores y de los artistas. Es decir, no puede ser un Mundiacul de puertas cerradas de ministros entre ministros. Y en esa lógica, lo que se ha estado haciendo es primero eh, las consultas regionales que terminaron la semana pasada con la de América Latina y el Caribe, después la de los países árabes, antes estuvieron en posición las de Europa, encabezadas o lideradas por Croacia, y la de África liderada por Senegal, y la de Asia-Pacífico liderada por Indonesia. Lo que sigue de camino hacia Mundiacult en adelante, pues es una serie de foros internacionales como este, como los Resiliats que se van a hacer, más un proyecto que se va a llamar El Micrófono Abierto, más una serie de foros internacionales temáticos que, que están brotando como palomitas de maíz en todo el, el orbe y que la idea o la pregunta que tenemos sobre, el, sobre cómo hacer que esos foros generen un mecanismo de design thinking que pueda construir la agenda y esa es la primera preocupación que es una preocupación técnica que se traduce en cómo esa información fluye a Mundiacul más, más 40 en eh, la sede en México cómo se transmite esa información. Y la segunda pregunta que tenemos, y yo quisiera invitar a, 
a este resiliarte a las organizaciones participantes porque su preocupación es fundamental. ¿Cómo organizamos eh, Mundiacult y la agenda de los ministros en esos tres días para que aquello no se convierta en una pasarela de discursos interminables de uno tras otro, donde cada uno tenga tres minutos, sino cómo se diseña la conversación de Mundiacult esos días, donde los actores participantes, los agentes participantes y las delegaciones participantes puedan interactuar de una manera tal que sea posible construir un diálogo y no una eh, pasarela interminable y en eso pues decirles que la organización de Mundiacult está abierta a sentarnos a pensar en el design thinking de esos días que está un proceso todavía no terminado de acabar pero que yo creo que las voces y las organizaciones que participan en este resiliar eh, podrían ser de gran ayuda así que en realidad levanto la mano para, para pedirle para abrir las puertas eh, en estos momentos que estamos en el design thinking de Mundiacult. Y la segunda pregunta o la segunda preocupación que es aún más estratégica es ¿qué instrumento necesita construir Mundiacult permanente? Yo no sé si para llegar a la agenda del objetivo 18, sino en realidad para colocar a la, a la, a la, a la cultura como un ODS, de camino a que pues, estamos a siete años de distancia que inició la agenda 2030, quedan otros siete de camino y entonces la agenda post, eh, agenda 2030 para el desarrollo, tiene que colocarlo ahí en el centro, pero la pregunta creo que tiene que ser un mandato de Mundiacult eh, y, que, y, y la idea es cómo construir ese mandato de Mundiacult, de qué mecanismo o qué formas se pueden construir para hacer evaluación, seguimiento, eh, 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 reservorio de datos e información y línea de trabajo que permita precisamente eh, a partir de Mundiacult generar ese mandato que caminara hacia la agenda eh, eh, post-2030, ¿no? la que llamaba Carlos Agenda 2050 y tantos. Eh, y en ese sentido, siendo yo un eh, optimista eh, desencantado, sí creo que es posible eh, convertir a Mundiacult en un espacio que permita precisamente generar esta agenda y ese músculo tan necesario para en verdad colocar a la cultura en el centro de las políticas de desarrollo y por el otro lado que nos obliga hablando de economía creativa, eh, hablando de protección del patrimonio cultural inmaterial, inmaterial, pues hablar, eh, dejar de hablar entre los habitu habituales sospechosos, entre nosotros mismos, encontrar la manera de construir el diálogo también con los agentes económicos, no solamente con los gobiernos, con el eh, poder empresarial, con la iniciativa eh, eh, privada, con los desarrolladores de plataformas, ¿no? Eh, en México, les pongo un ejemplo que es muy claro, porque sobre la preocupación del metaverso de Carlos es muy curioso, porque yo creo que el objetivo tiene que ser someter la técnica al espíritu, ¿no? El metaverso, entre otras cosas, permitirá espacios como este que sería imposible o impensable hace tan solo dos años, entonces tampoco hay que tener una suerte de rechazo a la tecnología, sino de encontrar la manera de someterla al espíritu como eh, 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 creo que tiene que, que, que suceder. Entonces, simplemente abrirles la puerta del espacio al Design Thinking de Mundiacult, estamos muy a tiempo, es un, fue un privilegio escucharlos esta, esta mañana y ofrecer desde, desde México el espacio en el proceso, no a la llegada de Mundiacult para encontrar una manera muy, eh, eh, mucho más eh, flexible que permita hacer que los actores interactúen ¿no? en el trabajo del diseño de la, del documento o de la declaración final que puede producir eh, Mundial Cool 2022. Así que muchas gracias a todos por escuchar. Gracias Pablo, te tomamos la palabra. Estamos, como campaña, estamos dispuestos a apoyar todos los esfuerzos para, para estar presentes en Mundial Cool, para que las voces de la sociedad civil, de los gobiernos locales, uh, del disenso uh, estén en, 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 en Mundial Cool. Y sobre, sobre el tema de, de los mecanismos de, de observación, de evaluación, dejadme compartir una vez más uh, los dos informes que producimos como campaña, el que hicimos en septiembre del 2019 y el que publicamos en diciembre de 2021, ambos escritos por EGE y el DIRIM con, con, con nuestra coordinación con la coordinación de las otras siete organizaciones que, que apuntan muy bien cómo algunos estados están tomando el marco de los ODS para para, para, para trabajar los temas culturales, 
Uh, y otros estados no lo están haciendo. Entonces, seguramente el sistema que, que UNESCO tiene y que en general las Naciones Unidas tienen debería ser un, un poco más valiente, por decirlo así, valiente como lo que no, nosotros hemos escrito en estos informes. Uh, en fin, uh, déjenme invitar a Alfonso Martinell a tomar la palabra. Alfonso ha escrito varios artículos sobre, sobre por qué no hay un objetivo cultura ¿Qué deberíamos hacer como, como actores culturales para estar allí? Uh, Alfons, tienes la palabra. Muchas gracias por la ocasión. Eh, voy a ser muy telegráfico. En primer lugar, yo creo que por mi experiencia y mi visión, eh, no hay un objetivo de cultura en los ODS por un tema político. Y la inclusión de la cultura en la futura agenda post-2030 es un tema político y se ha de trabajar cómo incorporar la cultura a la agenda política. En segundo lugar, yo creo que hay tres cosas que ya se han dicho aquí, fundamentales para de de definir un objetivo cultural en la agenda post-2030. En primer lugar, como decía John, la transversalidad. La transversalidad que nos ha obligado los ODS a ver que si hablar de desarrollo sostenible quiere decir dialogar, interactuar, con, otros, con otras perspectivas. La segunda, como también Alexandra ha dicho, la base, la base no es defender la cultura ni las industrias culturales, la base son los derechos culturales, los derechos humanos y los derechos culturales. Esta es la base de la construcción del objetivo, porque los otros objetivos se han construido en la base de derechos. En la, en la base de derechos, el derecho a la igualdad de género, el derecho a la educación, el derecho a disfrutar de, de la naturaleza, etc. Y, y la, y la otra tema importante es la transversalidad. Sobre todo, esta, para trabajar la transversalidad, nuestros trabajos nos han demostrado que hemos de cambiar de percepción. No hemos de hablar de cultura, hemos de hablar de sistemas culturales. Sistemas culturales que se configuran de muchos diferentes como forma que no responden al concepto de cultura-nación, sino realidades, sistemas culturales que a veces son multiculturales, sistemas culturales locales, nacionales, regionales y el sistema cultural global que estamos viviendo en este momento. Creo que esta visión sistémica nos permite dialogar mejor con los otros sistemas, ¿eh? con la salud, con la alimentación, con la educación, con la economía, nos permite... Y, y después dos, dos apuntes finales y ya termino. En primer lugar, hemos de ayudar a UNESCO, porque UNESCO ya en el 2000 y en el 2015 ha fracasado en su intento de incorporar la cultura a la agenda. ¿Eh? O sea, de, eh, hemos de, de, de ayudar y esta organización de una sociedad civil global, como estáis haciendo, me parece muy interesante, sobre todo con las iniciativas de ampliar eh, eh, con más organizaciones que den apoyo a la defensa de la presencia de la cultura en el post-2030. Eh, gracias. Muchas gracias, Alfonso. Muchísimas gracias, Alfonso. Gracias, Alfonso. Um, uh, now I move um, uh, on to um, another uh, very good colleague of ours who uh, was waiting in line to take the floor, uh, Rosanna Lewis. Um, From the British Council, uh, please, um, what would you like to say? Thank you, Ege, and thank you, everyone. Um, it's great to get to a point where we can ask questions, and thank you, really appreciate being brought, brought into this conversation. Um, as many of you might know, British Council has worked a lot on culture's contribution to the SDGs and sees it as the missing pillar. But I think this conversation has really, for me, highlighted how much we need to unite as cultural actors behind a shared vision of what a future for culture within sustainable development looks like. Um, I think we shouldn't take for granted the privilege that some of us have in terms of the spaces that we can talk about this and the people that we can influence, especially towards Mondia cult, but also bearing in mind the people that aren't in the room as Turkey kind of highlighted from the beginning and representing what culture means, not just to cultural organizations, ministries and, and high level NGO, international NGOs, but to those working locally on the ground um, towards sustainability in their communities through arts and culture and heritage. 
Um, the second point I wanted to sort of praise Alexandra for that kind of human rights led approach, but also the locally led that Carlos talked about, how can we highlight the informal more than the formal? And I think that speaks to my third point with, where I agree with John and Carlos on the redefinition of the parameters around sustainable development. Um, it's so important that if we have a culture goal or whenever we're talking about culture, that the way that we describe the impact, the indicators, the outcomes don't become data-driven and quantitative and economic as, as many of us have talked about, including you, Justin. Um, so I think it's really about finding a way to value the aspects of culture that we all value and the reason we work in this field, things like community building, um, notions of resilience and signs of peace that we can measure in different and more creative ways. Um, and the symbolism aspect that was also highlighted. And I just want to end with, um, yeah, the, the point around what is our role in the world and the world is changing all the time and digital is coming and, and it is gonna revolutionize the way that we see things, the way we communicate, the way we position ourselves out in, in the world. Um, so I think that should be a key part of a future conversation around culture and something that we need to be thinking about right now. Um, I'll just end in inviting you all to our upcoming talks on this subject with artists and practitioners, researchers, policymakers, and the private sector. 9th and 10th of March, and I have put a link in the chat, but I'll send it again. Thank you. Thank you so much, Rosanna. You're um, such a strong ally um, as the British Council uh, with um, a lot of events and um, important um, outputs. Um, so thank you for sharing the link. Um, and also, I think it's really valuable how uh, we have been um, a hand that has been reached out from uh, Pablo Rafael to us about how Mondia cult is still being designed and how we can still have inputs. Um, so that's really a valuable opportunity. And um, if I can just um, wedge in there um, a, a comment on the World Urban Forum, how the UN Habitat has been conducting these um, great fora where everybody feels like they are doing something, partake, partake, taking part in a festival, so to speak. Um, we already um, have been tr trying to um, uh, gather inspiration from how the World Urban Forum is conducted to make it more participatory, more of a festival um, kind of event, really. But anyway, um, we don't have a lot of time left. Um, and uh, uh, we have gone through um, the a list of um, attendees that were going to take the floor, and now we have 23 questions in the Q&A box. Uh, it's quite amazing um, the amount of um, you know um, uh, thought that this event has generated. So we're really thankful. And now we have a challenge um, because in 20 minutes um, this session is um, programmed to end, and we still have responses from our campaign members, but. Um, Jordi and um, friends, if you um, allow, we could just uh, read through these questions um, and then take the responses from our campaign members. And then in the final round from our panelists, um, try to um, gather them around in, in one you know, consolidated um, response at the end. Um, and I'm so sorry about my lack of linguistic diversity. So I'm going to skip the Spanish and leave those to Jordi. Is that OK? So I'll just read the English ones first, and then Jordi, you can take over and read the Q&A um, uh, in, in the questions in Spanish. Um, so Edgardo Antonio um, Bermejo Mora has asked, what result uh, would you expect from Mondia Cult regarding the inclusion of goal 18 or goal zero in the 2030 or the next agenda? Could a joint declaration of all attending ministers with the backing of UNESCO have a real impact on the UN's HLPF? Um, that's one question. I'm skipping Rosanna, sorry. Um, I'm also Justin. Uh, we have Francisco Morales in Spanish. Um, uh, we'll come to uh, that one. Ana Limon, what can be done to some way integrate culture in this eight years that remain of the agenda 2030? Um, 
skipping the Spanish. I'm so sorry about that. Um, Mohammed Najjar, it is not a question, but a comment. Many presenters brought up the issue of funding. If we succeed in making culture as integral part of any developmental agenda, this funding thing will be resolved. Yes, policy and budget connections. Uh, we have a link um, on YouTube. Um, I think the Q&A is visible to all. You can see the link. Otherwise, we can copy paste to the chat box. Uh, Luyanda Tetiana says, when we talk of culture, whose culture are we broadly addressing uh, when talking about the sustainable cultural development as an economic driver? The greater challenge is lack of knowledge on diverse cultures on the African continent. South Africa is a multi-diverse uh, country with a population of about 70 million. Its various cultures are largely unknown. Um, Moving on, um, there's a lot uh, to be spoken, um, Jordi, for you. Um, yes, actually, um, the rest of the questions are in Spanish, so I'm going to hand over to Jordi to uh, read them for us. <laughs> Please. Thank you, thank you very much. Eke. Muchas gracias. Yo, me vais a perdonar, pero no voy a leer las preguntas porque creo que estamos casi fuera de tiempo y es importante que que, que los miembros de la campaña Uh, expresen sus, sus puntos de vista también. Tan solo quería agradecer uh, muy encarecidamente a Francisco Morales por todas las observaciones que nos ha, nos ha escrito en el, en el chat. También a Gerardo Daniel Padilla uh, por, por su aportación y, y creo que uh, si queremos dar la palabra a los miembros de la coalición de la campaña y luego a los panelistas Estamos uh, sin, sin tiempo. Uh, so if, if you do not mind, let, let us invite Tere Badia, Claire Maguire, and Natalie Guy to, to take the floor for, for uh, your comments, uh, dear colleagues, observ observations. Uh, you have the floor, uh, Natalie. OK. Merci beaucoup. Je vais parler en français. Um, Bien, d'abord, je veux dire que je suis épatée par la profondeur et la richesse des réflexions euh, qu'on a eues aujourd'hui en si peu de temps. C'est vraiment fantastique. Je retiens plusieurs choses. D'abord, l'importance d'envisager un objectif sur la culture, mais comme un processus de réalisation des droits culturels à partir du local, en misant sur l'inclusion, la participation euh, de tous et toutes. Euh, notre propre participation dans ce processus-là, on doit aussi l'envisager en dialogue avec des personnes à l'extérieur du secteur de la culture, euh, donc d'autres perspectives pour contribuer à briser les silos en priorisant les enjeux aussi, euh, en, en, en basant nos analyses sur euh, les droits humains, la transversalité. Euh, je crois qu'il y a aussi une opportunité vraiment de débattre des concepts que l'on utilise, des concepts souvent dominants pour aborder euh, les enjeux culturels euh, et d'aborder aussi la question avec l'urgence requise par l'urgence climatique, en fait, et les développements technologiques, euh, où il va falloir dégager des opportunités parce que ça va se développer. On a parlé beaucoup du métavers. Le métavers, ça va arriver et c'est important de s'assurer que les droits humains soient euh, respectés et promus mieux aussi dans ces espaces-là. Donc, on ne peut pas s'en dégager et, et choisir de ne pas, de pas s'y impliquer, quant à moi. Et concrètement, il va falloir pour nous, dans la campagne, trouver le moyen de poursuivre cette discussion-là et d'élaborer un discours qui va être inspirant pour influencer au maximum euh, la conférence Mondiacoult. Alors, c'est tout pour moi. Merci beaucoup à toutes et tous pour vos contributions. Merci beaucoup, Nathalie. Tere Badia. You have the floor. Thank you so much. I'm going to take the opportunity uh, to have some interpreters. Uh, so I will address uh, uh, the panelists and, and, and the public and also in, in Spanish. So, muchísimas gracias. También estoy bastante impresionada. Muchísimas gracias por la contribución de todos los ponentes. Me ha parecido, uh, además de rico, uh, bastante problematizador y complejizador, por lo tanto, se agradece muchísimo esta, estas contribuciones y vuestra generosidad. Sí, yo creo que más que una, contrib una contribución, yo creo que has, se han tocado tres temas que son fundamentales, algunos más, otros menos. El primero es, eh, naturalmente, es el, es el siguiente, el, el, el 18, el, el gol número cero, el objetivo número cero uh, del desarrollo sostenible. A mí aquí me gustaría uh, simplemente apuntar que me parece 
muy importante también repensar la idea de desarrollo, tal y como se está entendiendo ahora. Creo que la idea de desarrollo, si no se tiene en cuenta la interdependencia de los distintos ecosistemas, Alfonso habla de una, una aproximación sistémica, no, va, no, va, no, no, no puede avanzar. ¿no? Tiene que incluir perspectivas que son holísticas, tiene que combinar cultura, ecología, lo social, lo sostenible, desde una perspectiva transdisciplinar, pero sobre todo y también, algo que también comentaba Toki, esta idea de lo interseccional. O sea, tenemos que revisar el actual paradigma de exclusiones, de cánones, de hegemonías, de dominaciones, también lo estaba comentando Alexander Chantaki. Yo creo que en este sentido esa definición de un nuevo objetivo o de la cultura como, 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 como valor transversal, como, como, como vector transversal, es fundamental que nos replanteemos también desde qué culturas y desde qué hegemonías estamos hablando. En segundo lugar, me parece que es fundamental trabajar también en la idea de de cara también Mondiacultia, como tema de Mondiacult, como las propias organizaciones culturales, los diversos agentes, personas que están, y las agencias de las personas que están trabajando en cultura, se pueden redirigir porque hay que, hay que repensar también las prácticas, hacer prácticas más sostenibles. Creo que tenemos que transformar modelos de producción cultural, analizar qué herramientas usamos, qué tecnologías, cuáles son las infraestructuras y repensar también algo que, que se apuntaba y ha habido también un, 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 una reflexión interesante la idea del valor de la cultura desde esta, de ese valor de que lo puramente inmediato, cuantitativo y económico hasta lo procesual con otros plazos y otros focos creo que aquí el, tenemos que empezar a, 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 a cambiar, a hacer un shift, un, un cambio de paradigma también en cómo, cómo evaluamos, cuál es el valor de la cultura y luego algo que también que se está apuntando por Toki Brown y que para nosotros también es fundamental es asegurar que el propio ecosistema cultural es sostenible en sí mismo. Tenemos que apoyar urgentemente a comunidades, a actores, a agentes culturales cuando se enfrentan a estos impactos de, de negativos de las crisis. Tenemos que garantizar la flexibilidad adecuada de leyes, de reglamentos, de programas de financiación. Tenemos que pensar en el reparto justo, retribución equitativa, la defensa de la libertad de expresión. Ahora mismo uh, también es, es fundamental para, para un poco defender y proteger la diversidad. Entonces yo sí que creo que ahora más de nunca, y es, ahora es el momento de, 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 de repensar estos paradigmas que están entrando en crisis por todas partes, desde los paradigmas sanitarios hasta los, los paradigmas de la paz que pensábamos que, tenías, que teníamos. Uh, y entonces a mí me parece que es necesaria una presencia generalizada de los debates culturales y de los agentes y las agentes culturales en todos los ámbitos políticos que sean necesarios. Necesitamos estas agendas que sean interdependientes, que sean coherentes y que sean complejas, que sean sobre todo complejas. Entonces, uh, bueno, se agradece mucho esta, la, vuestras intervenciones. Creo que el camino de Mondiacult uh, es, está, es, se está siendo pavimentado poco a poco y creo que sí es necesario esta que, que en Mondiacult uh, haya una presencia de estas voces de la sociedad uh, civil para articular esas la complejidad de las narrativas y también po poblar ese diálogo con las políticas, tal y como, como Alfonso apuntaba, y aquí, y aquí lo dejo. Gracias. Muchas gracias, Tere. Claire, from the International Federation of Libraries, Associations and Institutions, IFLA, you have the floor. Thank you, Jordi, and thank you to every all of the panelists who shared today. I, I found this to be extremely enlightening, but also very energizing. I think um, we're all quite um, passionate and energized about the work that has to be done. And I'm, and and as we're looking forward um, to to the post 2030 agenda, I think it was a very interesting point to pick up on that fragmentation of. Um, Of, of the 2030 agenda and looking at possible improvements in a integrated approach and and how culture is is um, really cross set, cross cutting. But um, I, I just wanted to pick up on the the discussion between that dedicated goal and um, perhaps a different approach where culture is integrated and 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 um, highlight some of the comments that were made in that those are not necessarily mutually exclusive and being able to, um, to recognize culture as a headline policy goal is an important aspect of making, of reaching out beyond the cultural sector and ensuring that the role of culture as a, as a crucial development accelerator is being recognized and then thus able to be applied um, more widely. Um, and I think in all of our work, 
it really is going back to not siloing culture, um, ensuring we are finding the right language and the right metrics to use to reach out beyond the cultural sector and connect to decision makers and stakeholders um, across the board where we can um, where we can build a, a wider body of knowledge around how culture plays a role in many different aspects of development and then upstream inclusion of culture in policymaking across the board. Um, I, I found it very interesting, the discussion we had around these new technologies. And, um, you know, we're talking about the future in the metaverse, but the new technologies and the digital divide and the gaps in access are already here. And um, there's a really critical role of access here and access to information and, and um, we can't create a framework that includes culture that still is leaving people out of the possibilities to access and share and create and benefit from knowledge. So that rights-based approach that we were discussing that centers equity and inclusion, I think is really critical. And um, just to echo some of those other calls for intersectionality, I think that is a, a key um, aspect that um, really needs to be focused when we're, when we're both preparing for Mandia calls, but also looking ahead um, and enabling that access to information, including cultural information is really critical. And, and that goes beyond culture, that goes to all the conditions and competencies that are needed to access that information. So I think um, I'm hoping, and I'm, I'm sure we can, when we go looking at Mandia cults, we can pick up on these sorts of really, um, these conversational and um, inclusionary um, aspects that we're doing in the preparation and bring that over into Mandia Cult itself. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Thank you very much. Ege, do you want to take the floor? Um, thank you so much. Um, now I'll put my e-commerce hat on for a very brief time. Um, we do have the International Council of Music um, uh, colleagues that, that we want to also channel here, but, um, but I'll leave that to you. So anyway, um, I'd just like to make three very quick points. Um, first of all, uh, what Toki said about um, the frontline um, first custodians as heritage practitioners, that really, um, I think, got, got to me and re re represents a lot of what we do with heritage at ECOMOS. And this is not just tangible physical cultural heritage, but intangible heritage and also indigenous communities. And we see the really critical role of indigenous communities for um, heritage protection as well and amplifying the uh, impact of heritage. Um, secondly, um, mutual mainstreaming, um, what we found in, in the recent ECOMOS policy guidance that we drafted for the SDGs, there were three strands of work for us to do, which uh, one was to promote promote heritage um, and cul culture um, uh, by association um, as a driver of sustainability to protect heritage from unsustainable development and to align heritage so that we also transform ourselves to be more sustainability um, um, aligned, um, to, to, to update some heritage practices to be uh, more sustainable, for example, with gender, let's say. Um, and the third point um, is how actually heritage seems to be maybe the luckiest um, uh, a subsector of, of the culture world because we have our own targets, 11.4, about protecting heritage, but that has not by far been enough really to um, uh, show and you know realize the full potential and impact that we need uh, to, to bring together heritage and sustainability. So um, a, a culture goal, a fourth cultural dimension, more transversality of culture will also benefit us heritage practitioners as well, for sure. Um, that's all I um, will say, but um, I would like to pay tribute to both um, Princess Dana and Toki as my colleagues from ECOMOS. So when they make final points, anything you'd like to add on behalf of ECOMOS, please feel free. Thank you very much, Jordi. Yes, we are about to finish. Let me add that uh, the International Music Council and the arterial network are uh, also members of this campaign. Celia Fisher and Kane Liman Monza cannot join this, this uh, conversation. Um, they uh, comment, uh, let me summarize what they have said in our, in our WhatsApp uh, chat in one sentence. We need alliances across and beyond the cultural sector. And, and as UCLG, 
what can we say? We uh, are enthusiastically supporting the idea of a culture goal. We are extremely, extremely uh, happy by the, the, the rich conversation we have held. And we expect this, this say, uh, bold, uh, this ambition uh, to be, uh, uh, to grow, to grow in uh, Mondiacult and to grow in the years after Mondiacult when, when uh, cities, local governments, with nations, and especially with the civil society whose role in the global conversation on culture needs to be stronger and stronger and stronger. We believe that this can lead us to have, yes, uh, a more clear presence of these elements in the, in the development agenda. Uh, final comments. We are about to, to, to close the session, but perhaps one minute one minute and a half for each one of our uh, speakers, beginning with Toki Brown. Did we just lose Toki? Let's see if she's back. Uh, otherwise, uh, Princess Dana Furas, do you want to take the floor? There's Toki. Sure, thank you. Um, so I will um, uh, say that on, you know, uh, on behalf of the Arab region of ICOMOS, we, we have had consultations across the board about, about this and tried to feed into the Monte Cult um, process. And, and the issues that, have, that were un, um, underlined as part of this consultation process echo very much the sentiments and, and the issues that, that we have heard today. And so I think there is agreement across the board of the importance of um, really bringing culture into the sustainable development conversation in a, in, in a very meaningful way. Um, I think my final comments are threefold. One um, probably directed at, at Pablo um, is I think the Mondial process should really stand behind a goal, a dedicated goal for culture as part of the sort of uh, uh, SDG um, 2030 agenda and beyond. And, and it should be a very strong recommendation that comes out of this whole process. Um, I also feel that, yes, the goal has to be a rights-based built goal, uh, simply because all the other goals are, are rights-based. And I think one of the speakers said that, and I agree with that completely. There is a, a, a right to culture a right to heritage. And I think that that concept needs to be highlighted as we build the goal. And my final one is process. And yes, culture and heritage are incredibly diverse, uh, you know, just rich, um, multi-dimensional concepts. And, and we cannot come to terms with every part of, of that and what it means to all of us without a process of dialogue, of debate, of engagement at all levels by everybody. And I think go, this campaign, the Monte Cup process and beyond and, and made much of the work of UNESCO as well um, with its shortfalls or otherwise and ICOMOS and others are part of this consultative process that I think will get us closer and closer to, to a place that, that we feel would do justice to culture as culture and within the sustainable development agenda. Thank you very much. We have Toki back. Uh, Toki, you have the floor for the final uh, comments. Uh, thank you so much. I've quite enjoyed all of this. Um, coming from the uh, ICOMOS work, African Working Group, also Cultural Landscapes. Um, yes, culture is in everything. It's We see it in everything we do. It's in, in our memories, it's in everything we do. And it's, it's frustrating to know that this wasn't part of the deal when we're going forward this. I Toki froze again. Shall we wait three, four seconds? I'm All right. Frozen. Yes, you're frozen. Yeah, I know. You're back. I'm back. <laughs> try again, please. Try again. 
it's snowing in upstate New York. So I'm having issues with my internet all of a sudden. <laughs> so anyway, so m my last, you know, stand on this again is that policy priorities, policy priorities, local, 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 small scale, up understanding that they're local actors, they're local actors, and the local actors need to be part of this discussions as well. That will be my last stand on that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. John Crowley, you have the floor. Thanks very much. Um, a lot of very interesting issues have been raised, um, including many substantive ones, but let me make my final comments just on process. Because in the UN system, generally speaking, by default, as uh, to borrow a phrase, process eats substance for breakfast. Um, and that has several implications. First, if this issue is still being discussed in 2028, then there won't be a culture goal. Um, in other words, the challenge is to make it absolutely obvious that there will be, so that no one even asks the question. And that's a big challenge, because time is quite short to achieve that, even though 2030 sounds like a long time away. Uh, second implication, uh, following directly from that, um, Monte Akut probably should be, definitely should be a process, not just an event, uh, because it's unlikely that everything will be achieved uh, this September. So while a ministerial declaration is incredibly important, it's one of the most significant outcomes that this kind of event can achieve, it will need to be a declaration that maps the process by which over the following couple of years, it becomes absolutely obvious that there will be a culture goal. And that will go th probably through several uh, pathways, including the HLPF, including UNESCO's general conference, including perhaps uh, some kind of follow-up event. Uh, and third, how to make it, make it a success in process terms. I'd be tempted to say, look at Rio plus 20 and do exactly the opposite. Rio plus 20 was by the uh, desire of member states themselves run, as they put it, in formal decisions on a purely intergovernmental basis. This guaranteed failure. But of course, the same member states are just as jealous of, of the intergovernmental prerogatives now as they were 10 years ago. So the challenge is to create the space for a different kind of event. And if Rio plus 20 is too long to think back, just think back to COP26 in Glasgow. So, longer is, so long as there's a blue and a green zone, it's not gonna work. So in terms of process intelligence, in terms of design thinking, the question is how to create the conditions where member states of the UN system, ministers and their representatives, agree to be in the same room as civil society. That's actually a, a, a huge challenge and it goes against the current spirit of the UN system. But if you can't do that, then you probably won't achieve anything. So Mexico as host state and UNESCO as sponsoring organization will need primarily, I think, to work on that. And that's why uh, probably the result won't be achieved immediately, but the right kind of process can be created to achieve the result in about three years, which is the deadline beyond which the result would come too late spoken as a true former UN bureaucrat. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Extremely valuable observations. Sincerely, thank you very much. Carlos Villaseñor, tu minuto y medio para dos minutos para tus, últimas, tus últimos <laughs> comentarios. Bueno, me parece que los estados parte de Mundia Cult eh, deberán reflexionar que es a partir de sus diferencias, de sus singularidades, de sus eh, diferencias culturales que es posible constituirse como países individu individualizados. Si no se fortalece estas capacidades de diferencia a partir de la identidad, eh, muy probablemente veremos la dilución de los países eh, como tales frente, frente a la globalización. Me parece que Mundiacult 40 más es una magnífica oportunidad también para plantear una estrategia de cómo llevar el desarrollo sostenible a lo local, eh, cómo eh, promover estos valores desde locales, desde lo local, desde las personas, desde donde se construye la soberanía de los países. 
Y probablemente yendo más allá, yo diría que la principal responsabilidad que tendrían que tener en la Agenda 2050 los países es cómo darle a las personas las capacidades, las habilidades para eh, redefinir el sentido de su desarrollo. Tal vez lo, lo terminaría diciendo que si bien durante el siglo XX y principio del siglo XXI el lema de la UNESCO ha sido construir la paz en la mente de los hombres, a partir de Mundial Cult, 40 más, el lema debería ser cómo darle elementos y capacidades a la gente para que construyan ellos mismos la paz desde lo propio. Muchísimas gracias, Carlos. Un mensaje muy necesario, muy necesario hoy, hoy esta semana y en los días que van a venir. Gracias. Uh... Gracias a ustedes y gracias a todos, Alexandra. A, a, a todos ha sido un gusto estar con ustedes. Indeed. Alexandra Shantaki, uh, your final minutes, two minutes for your comments, uh, observations, new questions, whatever you wish. You have the floor. Alessandra Santaki, oh, yes, you sorry, have Sorry, yes, yes, sorry, I missed you there. Um, thank you so much. I, I don't want to kind of um, use these two minutes for conclusions because I think this would reduce such a really kind of mature debate. And, and I learned a lot in, in, uh, um, in these two hours. There are some meetings that uh, one goes and, you know, one is really happy to have been there. So thank you so much uh, to, to all of you. Um, the only thing I'm going to say is that the next report, the next report of the UN Special Rapporteur is going to be on ta -da, development and cultural rights. Um, and maybe uh, we can be allies in some of the, um, uh, in some of the uh, uh, agreed um, uh, parts of the agreed vision. Uh, that uh, for, for 2030. So I'm looking forward to receiving um, your submissions and your statements and to, to discussing with you these issues more. It's going to be submitted. The report will have to be submitted by June. So we don't have a lot of time. Um, and uh, uh, talking about participation and consultation, uh, your voices really matter a lot to, to my mandate. And thank you very much for these two hours. Unfortunately, I have to go to a meeting about Ukraine, so I'm going to have to leave now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, dear Alessandra. Thank you very much. Ege, shall we close the, the event? Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. It's amazing. Um, we are so blessed to have everybody here. And uh, this is only part of the process. So see you soon and keep in touch. Uh, any questions, please find us. Um, see you at Mondia Cult, hopefully. Yes, and a special gratitude to the interpretation teams and to the technical teams. Thank you very much, uh, Claire, Marta, Agnes, Saga, uh, all the interpreters, uh, the team of interpreters led by Mariam. Thank you very much for your great work. Thank you, Jordi, for keeping us together too. Pleasure. Stay well. See you Thank soon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.